tonight, the reason that you guys are here is <clears throat> to hear about fall migration madness. Um, in Minnesota, migration lasts for months and this presentation is gonna give you a chance to figure out when and where to see some of the best areas for bird migration, you know, whether you're hiking or biking or, or whatever. Uh, Sharon Stittler, our presenter, is a writer and park ranger. She presented to us last year and wowed us with her presentation. She's um, based in the Twin Cities area, has written three books and appears regularly on TV and radio as the bird chick answering questions about birds. And so we're really excited to have Sharon back this week. So um, take it away, Sharon. All right, so migration madness, as uh, Fran pointed out to everybody earlier, uh, migration, a lot of people think with migration that it's something that happens uh, maybe over a few weekends in the spring and fall. Uh, but one of my all time favorite books is by Scott Widensall, and it's called Living on the Wind, and it's about migration. It was nominated for a Pulitzer. Uh, but he says in that book that on any given day in the year, some bird somewhere on the planet is migrating. And I would even argue that it probably happens here in the United States, maybe not quite in Minnesota, but migration lasts quite a long time. And a great example that I like to use is, I like to ask people, when do you think migration starts in Minnesota? So just, I can't see your answers right now, but kind of think in your head about when, when it starts. Some people say August. But migration actually starts in July, late July in Minnesota. And there's even some debate that uh, if you see certain shorebird species in late June, early July, that's probably already their migration. And these are birds that nest up in the Arctic Circle of North America and they have a very brief window to migrate. And if their nest fails, then they have to go ahead and head back. But their young start showing up in the state of Minnesota uh, in late, in late July and early August. And these are uh, birds that maybe not necessarily everybody, everybody in the rovers are gonna go see, but these are like uh, lee sandpipers and uh, semi-palmated sandpipers, just all the little tiny peeps that you might see working uh, a muddy area or some sod farms around here. And I can attest that they do in fact nest in the Arctic Circle. I took a trip to Barrow, Alaska this summer and I don't know if a rover ever won a program about that, but that was pretty amazing. And I got to see these guys actually on nest and it was pretty spectacular. So migration goes all the way through, starts in late July, that's when birders start getting excited. And when does migration end? It doesn't have a hard and fast point, but generally based on a lot of the surveys that I've done here in the state, it can end as late as early to mid-December or pretty much once everything starts to freeze up. And as climate change has kind of been putting uh, <laughs> some interesting interpretations of when everything freezes up here, that date does appear to be getting later and later. But duck migration does go into December if everything stays open. Uh, one of my favorite things about night migrate or about migration is that you it's something you can enjoy at night. Uh, most bird species actually migrate at night and they show up on radar. Uh, this is uh, an image taken from um, uh, the University of Wisconsin's NEXRAD radar. And it, it does a really great job of uh, showing all different parts of the United States. And precipitation will show up on NEXRAD radar as, uh, you know, like the distinct swirl. So this is an image of Hurricane Flor Florence from 2018. And you can see it down there in the Gulf of Mexico uh, along Texas and Louisiana. You can see some precipitation to the north of it. It's the distinct yellow and green, maybe a little red in there. But when you see all those blue circles, what's happening is all those radar stations can detect that something is in the air and that it's moving and that there is a lot of it. And it's moving, so it can't really define it the way it defines a cloud or precipitation, but it knows something is there. So it takes the entire area that it's sensing the movement and the objects in the air and it's just documenting it as blue. And years ago when these first started showing up on NEXRAD radar, uh, the Air Force thought it, they just called them uh, angel impressions. And they just thought it was just something in the air, but research has shown that it is in fact millions of birds migrating at night. And sometimes when I can't sleep 
or uh, if I open up this radar and I see that there are a lot of blue circles over the Twin Cities and we have kind of heavy cloud cover, I'll sit outside in the dark in the backyard. My neighbors don't think I'm too strange at this point. Uh, <laughs> and you can actually hear the birds giving contact calls to each other. They're not singing, they're more uh, what birders call chip notes. And so you'll hear this kind of zip, 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 zip. And basically what it is, is it's all the birds. It's like, I'm over here, are you over here? Yeah, I'm still flying. And they're, it's just contact calls to let them know that they're in sync with each other. And some birders are quite good at identifying these. They can pick them out and say, well, that's clearly uh, a black-bellied plover that is a Swainson's thrush. I'm not nearly that good. I can definitely tell when something is a warbler, when something is a thrush but I'm not quite that good, but it, it, I love sitting outside and listening to this and just realizing that there are millions of birds flying over at night. Now, a lot of people may wonder, why is it that birds are, uh, oh, oh, I'd also, before I go too soon, I wanna point this out. Um, this is a, a video of the 9-11 Tribute and Light Memorial that happens in uh, New York City where the Twin Towers used to be. And you can see in this screen grab, all those little white dots. Those are birds. When this first started happening, people in New York were taking images and video of this phenomena. And they thought, well, it's insects. No, it's a little too big. Maybe it's the souls of everybody who died. That's not it. Basically, there are these giant pillars of light that are going in the sky and it's happening right during migration season. And the East Coast is a major flyway. And so these birds are migrating through and they're attracted by this bright light. And when they get into those two lights, it is so bright in there, it confuses them. It's it's daylight. And so they start to fly out and it's like, no, 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 it's dark. I think I should stay in here. And they stay in that area. Now, New York City Audubon works with the people who do the Tribute and Light. And on nights when they can tell it, there's going to be a big migratory push, they'll work with them to turn the lights off for a few minutes to get the birds to move on. If they didn't turn off those lights, thousands and in some nights, millions of birds would get caught in those lights and they would exhaust themselves uh, and not be able to continue to migrate. Migration is a marathon. So these birds have to load up on fat. They're super fatty before they take on this trip. And so they could easily deplete all their fat reserves. And I believe this is a video and we should actually see these birds moving here. There. Might even hear some chip notes. Every time I share this video, I get chills watching it because hearing some of those chip notes, those are warblers, vireos, thrushes, maybe even some rose-breasted grosbeaks, birds that we're familiar with in our backyard. And you get a sense of just how many birds are moving through uh, in a night. And there will be that many birds caught and then they'll shut it off for 15 minutes and then an hour later, they'll have the same amount. It's not the birds that they just got to move on. It's more birds coming uh, through at night. So it's just, it gives me chills to think that there are that many birds that are moving at night that we just never see. So why do so many birds migrate at night? Well, I'll tell you, hawks like to migrate during the day. There is a big hawk migration and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, <laughs> this is a Cooper's hawk who's re recently eaten. You can see she has that kind of Dolly Parton look and that's because her crop is chock full of probably white throated sparrow. But uh, as hawks are moving south, they need a good food source and they time their migration to go when uh, songbirds migrate through. Uh, Northern flickers are one of my favorite birds, but boy, howdy do Cooper's hawks and peregrine falcons eat quite a few of them during their migration as well. And hawks rely on thermals or warm currents of air to soar for their migration. They're not going to flap as much. That helps them conserve energy. Songbirds can't soar, so they're going to flap whether it's sunny, so it's easier for them to do it at night. And what's interesting with a lot of these birds is that each bird is different in how they learn their route. Uh, some birds like indigo buntings, uh, studies have shown they're kind of pre-programmed to migrate. There's just something in their brain that uh, as photo period gets shorter and it is time to go south, 
something in them tells them to go south for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of miles and then something tells them to go west uh and there's actually really kind of a disturbing study that people did where they put satellite transmitters on uh indigo buntings uh and they took them from the east coast and they released them on the west coast and the transmitters proved that they still went south and then they went west and they went out into the pacific and were never heard from again other birds, like say sandhill cranes and trumpeter swans, they learn their route. And so the adults teach them where they need to go, where the stopover sites in their first year of migration, and they imprint on that, and that's what they do. Uh, so it's kind of cool. So you can go to some of these predictive areas like Crex Meadows in Wisconsin is a great place to go look for uh, fall migrating sandhill cranes. Uh, Carlos Avery is another good place. Uh, the, the downside is uh, with trumpeter swans, as we learned in Monticello, uh, there was that neighborhood that was feeding trumpeter swans for years, and there was one to 2,000 and trumpeter swans that ended up spending the winter there. And the DNR has been trying to break the swans of that habit. Uh, and they've even gone so far as to make the neighborhood stop feeding the swans. But the problem is those young birds, it's like, this is where I was told to go my first year. And this is where I'm going to go. And that food isn't there. And so there's some issues with that and they don't necessarily know where to go. So migration is just fascinating because it just goes differently for different birds. Sometimes birds go weird directions during migration. Uh, this was a couple years ago. This is a bird called a roseate spoonbill that showed up this time of year at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. This is a bird that's supposed to stay in Florida or sometimes they'll go down into Central and South America. And this bird just went north. Uh, it probably had to do something with the uh, red tide that was going on at the time. But uh, sometimes birds will show up off course. This time of year uh, is when our hummingbird migration starts to peter out. It's still possible to see a hummingbird at your bird feeder, especially in the metro area this time of year. You don't get the huge flocks, but you might get one young one passing through. But in another couple weeks, if a hummingbird shows up and you still have your hummingbird feeder out, chances are good it's not the usual ruby-throated hummingbird that we associate here. It's a bird that maybe is from California and decided to go east instead of going south. Um, sometimes we get weirdos uh, coming in from Mexico. Um, there's a, a species called uh, a violet ear that will sometimes pop up in the northern United States this time of year because something inside them tells them to go north instead of going south. Uh, and they, they last a surprising long time in winter, uh, given if they have enough food. So uh, to talk about things that you can expect during fall migration, even though we've missed this, maybe this is something you can uh, kind of keep in mind as you're hiking around next year. Uh, but July and early August is a great time to go birding. Uh, a lot of birders love to go to sod, sod farms, mud flats. Uh, we're also not opposed to going to sewage lagoons. That's a popular place to find birders during migration. Uh, and th that's where we look for the peeps, the shorebirds. I, I call them kind of the Dr. Seuss of birds because uh, they can have long tapered beaks that they, they can just be in all different shapes and sizes. And so we live for looking for these birds in short grasses. And they're some of our earliest migrants to move through. Uh, a great place to go in August. Actually, this is supposed to be August and September, but I would still go to Spring Lake Park this time of year. Uh, it's a great spot for migration. Um, it's a great spot to, you can see egrets that congregate there. Uh, you can stand up on the bluffs and look down. And when the egrets are congregating and moving through in September, you can see big flocks of them. You can also see huge flocks of pelicans there. Uh, and of course, bald eagles are there all the time. And warblers push through there like crazy. And sometimes we get rarities from the West Coast that show up. We've had a Townsend warbler show up, but it's just, it's got great habitat. And the Mississippi River has food, water, shelter, uh, and it's its own migratory corridor that birds follow down. So when in doubt, Spring Lake Park is just a fantastic spot for uh, fall migration. And, and take a good pair of binoculars if you want to try and separate out the egrets from the pelicans there. And of course, warblers. This is a, a black and white warbler that I got during a migration at Spring Lake Park. Hawk Ridge is another place to go. 
Uh, Hawk Ridge is up in Duluth, Minnesota, and it's a lot of people think about it in mid-September uh, because they get this big push of broad-winged hawks, and you can get thousands of broad-winged hawks flying over on the right day. You want to go up there on a day when the winds are out of the northwest. Uh, a, a good day at Hawk Ridge can be 16,000 to 26,000 broad-winged hawks flying over in a day. Uh, one day, I had the choice of, do I want to catch up on laundry that I've kind of let pile up for the last three weeks. Boy, the winds look really good at Hawk Ridge. I'm going to go up for the day. And I did. And I ended up seeing 100,000 broad-winged hawks fly over that day. Uh, I still had a mountain of laundry to deal with when I got home, but I still felt pretty solid in that decision. Uh, but there are other species that fly over too. Uh, the great thing that I love about Hawk Ridge is if you want to have kind of a chill day, you can go up there with a couple of camp chairs and just camp out with all these people. And the counters and the naturalists will be there and they'll point out exciting species that fly over. We went there last year and we had a northern goshawk fly over and the, the counters warned us uh, and we got to see it really closely. But if you need to move, they have some fantastic trails up there and good rigorous trails. I highly recommend if anyone's taking notes, take the yellow dot trail. Uh, it has a, another look, I think the scenic overlook trail, but just follow the yellow dots and you will get one of the best views of Duluth in your life, especially this time of year. It uh, kind of points you to the north. So you have uh, Lake Superior off to your left and then you get this beautiful undeveloped kind of boggy area. And it's and also if the winds are out of the Northwest and the hawks are flying through, sometimes they're low enough. So you get the sharp shinned hawks flying right at you. There is a banding station at Hawk Ridge, and so if the banders get some interesting birds of prey, they will bring them out so you can get to see them up close, especially the sharp-shinned hawks that are moving through. But migration at Hawk Ridge pretty much goes through uh, into early December. You get fewer birds in November, but I personally really like October because you that's typically when uh, the leaf color peaks. And you also get some of the sexier raptors. I mean, a lot of people like to go in September, like I said, for the broad-winged hawks. But in in October, that's when you can start to get the rough-legged hawks, you get more bald eagles, uh, golden eagles are possible, uh, and then jeer falcons. So it's just, you get more variety and you get some of the sexier birds of prey. Now let's say you have decided to take my advice and you go to Hawk Ridge for a weekend, you get a nice air b and and you get up there, the winds are terrible or even worse, it's foggy. Then a great alternative on a foggy day during hawk migration is to go down to Park Point in Duluth and walk along Lake Superior. And on foggy overcast days, especially if the wind is bad, uh, this becomes kind of a fallout area for migrating birds. And you can see all kinds of birds here. Uh, it's a great spot for warblers, for thrushes, for vireos. And oftentimes they're really hungry, so they're down low and they're easy to see. Uh, you can walk along the shore. Sometimes you get some good shorebirds. Black-bellied plovers will show up there. And if you're really hardcore about it, and some of my friends are really hardcore about it, uh, you can watch out on the lake. And sometimes seabirds will show up, like long-tailed Jaegers will show up. Uh, they're, they're distant out, but if that is a bird you'd like to see, Park Point is a great place to go look for those species. So yeah, put Duluth on your list for fall migration. Uh, in August and September, the, this migration is pretty much over by now, but it's something, it's a question that I get a lot. In the evenings, people will see uh, these birds flying over in big numbers, usually over their yards. At Hawk Ridge, you can sometimes see 15,000 fly over. Uh, and these are common nighthawks. They're goat suckers. Uh, it, it, they're in the same family as whippoorwills. And they fly around with their mouths wide open and they grab insects. And in Minnesota, they're typically active at dusk and at night. Uh, when I've done bird surveys down in Texas, they're active all during the day, but they have pointy wings. They have a very bouncy wing flap uh, and they have those white stripes and it makes them very noticeable. But one of my favorite things to do in September is to sit out in uh, our backyard and uh, watch these birds fly over. So that's another cool thing to see in September. Chimney swifts, uh, they're small cigar shaped birds that twitter and fly around in the metro area as they're passing through. They'll look for a gigantic chimney, uh, sometimes at old schools that have the big chimneys and you can get thousands of chimney swifts roosting and going in to sleep in them at night. So that's another popular September thing to do is to look for chimney swift roosts. And then Bedote is a great place to go look for birds in September and also now. It's the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota River. Uh, and it is, it's, it's kind of like 
where 35E and 35W connect to just make 35 and you get a ton of great birds down there. Uh, it, it's, it's great for hummingbirds. You can see all kinds of warblers. This is a magnolia warbler in this photo. Red-breasted nuthatches. Uh, they're just all kinds of birds. Didn't you just have Big River Journey down there? Did yes. you get some good birds? Uh, mostly we saw egrets. Egrets. Okay, so egrets are still moving through. Brian just had to do some ranger field trips down there. It's, of course, great for bald eagles. Um, barred owls are active down there, and you can quite frequently hear them hoot during the day. But this is a great area to go look for birds. And even if you're not into birds, there are big, obvious birds to see down there. Like Brian said, the egrets. There's a robust turkey population. Uh, there's also a robust deer population. And if you're really lucky, you might see the piebald deer that's down there. That's brown and white. Its first year, it kind of looked like a little calf. And now it's got, actually has antlers. So it's just, it's really a wonderful spot to go birding. You can also get cedar wax wings down there. Uh, they'll be, <laughs> they'll be along the buckthorn that people are always trying to remove, but they like to eat it too. Uh, also watch for them around wild grape and also watch for them right over the water. One thing that they like to do, uh, this time of year is they'll perch in the trees and then they fly catch and they'll zip out and they'll grab an insect and go back, uh, to the tree. And you can always tell them because they have that distinct yellow tail tip when they fly. And now, as we're getting into October, well, late September, they're possible, but now for sure in the last week, we're getting these birds. Dark-eyed juncos have shown up. They're affectionately known as the snowbird because they spend the winter here in Minnesota. They do breed up in the uh, northeastern section of the state, but they are a bird when you see them in your backyard. It's like Ned Stark says, winter is coming, and these, these birds are here. So uh, that's a bird that shows up there, and they're probably showing up in your backyard right now. They sound like little lasers when they're fighting with each other. So if you're ever are sitting outside and you hear kind of a pew, 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 and you see a bird with uh, two white tail stripes, that is the dark-eyed junco. So we're getting into October and the birds that we're seeing now. So like I said, hummingbirds are still poppy, possible. I just saw a report of one yesterday in the metro area. They'll still probably have a few more squeak by. If you have a hummingbird feeder or if you know someone who has a hummingbird feeder and you're like, oh, they need to take that in because the hummingbirds aren't going to migrate if it's out. That's not true. Photo period or the length of daylight controls migration far more than a bird feeder does. So uh, don't worry about that hummingbird. It still has a chance to get out of here. Uh, birds that are uh, moving in right now. We have American robins that are showing up. These are different than the robins that are in our yards in the summertime. These are robins coming down from Alaska and Canada, uh, and they will spend the winter with us. Uh, watch for them right now, especially on hackberries and of course buckthorn and um, wild grape. They will in the wintertime too find areas uh, along the river uh, that has open water and some muddy areas. They're looking for invertebrates in there. They sometimes will follow ice fishermen and eat their discarded minnows as well. Uh, another bird that we get right now, this brown bird, it's one of my favorites. It's the fox sparrow. They're oftentimes mixed in with the white-throated sparrows and it's just a big sassy reddish brown bird that kicks leaves around looking for seeds. So that's a bird to watch for right now. And we have quite a few butter butts or yellow rumped warblers moving through. Uh, when they're in your yard, you can usually tell they make kind of a kiss sound as their chip notes. If you hear kind of a that's, uh, that's yellow rimmed warblers in your backyard. And they're looking for insects, but they also love to come to bird baths too. Um, this time of year is a great time to just hang out as much as possible on the Mississippi River to look for birds. Uh, and then if you get it, if you can go down into Hastings, you can see some great stuff there too. And waterfowl migration is kicking into high gear. Uh, years ago, I used to do aerial waterfowl surveys uh, for the park service. And so we would fly in a plane uh, above the Mississippi River, pretty much from St. Paul down to the Iowa border. Uh, and we would go about 100 miles an hour, 120 feet above the Mississippi River and count ducks. Uh, <laughs> and it's a lot harder than it sounds. But anyway, uh, these are some of the ducks that you can see right now. Uh, Gadwall, they're one of my favorite ones. It's just this big gray duck. They're even a little bit bigger than a mallard. And they 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 make this great sound where they go, meh, meh. Right, right, right. So they're moving through. Common golden eyes are going to be moving through. They usually arrive a little bit later in larger numbers, but they're possible now. And then the super tiny ruddy duck uh, is also moving through. 
Oh, this is a picture from the plane that I would take when we would count ducks on the Mississippi River. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't an exact science. We wouldn't get an exact amount of birds, but we'd get a rough estimate. But these are examples of rafts of ducks uh, of what we would see uh, between here uh, and the Hastings area of Minnesota. This was taken closer to Winona uh, and just so many ducks uh, along the river in there. So, <laughs> and this is what it looks like uh, if you want to try and test your skills at identifying birds. Uh, I can tell you, let's see, one, two, there are three different species of ducks in this photo. And if you think, fancy yourself a duck expert and want to kind of guess at what some of the ducks uh, are in here, you sure can. I will tell you that there is canvas back. Those are the ducks that are the lightest in color on the back. Uh, and there are some lesser scop in there. And I see at least one widgeon and widgeons are the ones that are kind of rusty on the back. Pay no attention to the man sneaking out of my office and creaking on the wood floor. <laughs> Okay, and this time of year is super exciting because we get Minnesota's smallest owl moving through the northern sawwet owl. And I know for a fact that they're moving through because I have a lot of friends who banned sawwet owls in the fall. Uh, some do it uh, with uh, Carpenter Nature Center, which is another great place to go hiking and birding. Uh, some do it up in Duluth and they are getting these teeny tiny owls right now. And these owls can be about the size of your fist and uh, they can show up in your yard this time of year. They're usually in a real thick tangle. They like cedar trees. Uh, they like really thick tangles of buckthorn. They love to hang out in oak trees too, as all the other leaves, all the other trees lose their leaves. Uh, they'll uh, hang out in an oak tree and blend in with some of their brown leaves. A great way to find them is to listen for angry chickadees. Uh, Chickadees, when they're really angry and they find a predator, they will do that D D D call over and over again. So it's just D D D D D D D. I mean, if you hear it like that nonstop, go out and look for a predator. As a matter of fact, two weeks ago, I heard that outside the office window and I was like, oh, good, maybe they found a saw white owl. And I went outside. Uh, no, the chickadees were yelling at a coyote that was running through our Falcon Heights backyard. So pay attention to angry chickadees. They can usually show you cool stuff. Now, November is coming up and that's when uh, duck migration gets into full swing. Also sandhill crane migration uh, goes full bore. I know with federal guidelines, being a federal employee, more and more places are opening up. I don't know if Carlos Avery or Sherburn are going to have their programs like they normally do with sandhill cranes to take you out to see them. If not, seriously consider heading out to Crex Meadows in the evening, it is a wonderful way to go out there, maybe grab yourself some honey crisp apples. I don't know, take a box of wine, like the little boxes, and just sit out there and watch the cranes come in as they roost. And it's easy enough to find them. You either find where all the cars are parked on the side of the road, or you just follow the flocks of cranes coming in. But it's a beautiful sound. They're beautiful birds. And it's a great way to uh, bring in the November weather as the sandhill cranes gather up together before they make their final push to get down into Indiana and Florida. This is also when swan migration kicks in. Uh, there are two native swans to Minnesota. There's a non-native swan. I don't have a picture of it here. That's the mute swan. It's the one that looks like the traditional swan that you see in books and has the orange nose. But the native swans here are the trumpeter swans. They're here year round. They're the ones that nest in the metro area. And then there's also tundra swans. And tundra swans only pass through here. They breed up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, and when they pass through, they sound a little bit like yippy dogs when they're flying over and frequently they'll fly over at night. You'll be able to hear them. They typically show up the second and third week uh, in November and you just kind of hear this whoop, 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 whoop. Or I guess maybe they sound more like Curly from the Three Stooges. But um, uh, you'll get huge flocks of 50 to 100 uh, swans flying over. When they're close up, you can tell them apart quite easily. You'll notice on the top bird that is a tundra swan. It has the little bit of yellow on the beak and also they have a, a kind of a high pitched woo woo call. Whereas the trumpeter swan has a much bigger black beak and they sound like a kid playing with a toy trumpet. And if you've gone kayaking in northern Minnesota along some of our lakes, uh, Rice Lake National Wildlife Refuge, you can hear them uh, all over there. Uh, we, we have quite a few trumpeter swans. And like I said, you can go to places like Monticello and see quite a few. Uh, Picnic Island has them all winter long because they keep the water open. Park Point, uh, or not Park Point, um, 
Point Douglas uh, near Prescott, Wisconsin. It'll have a, a flock of trumpeter swans that spend the entire winter there. But with Trump or with tundra swans in November, we can get 20 to 40,000 show up on the Mississippi River. Uh, and this picture you see here uh, of the swans, this is uh, a picture that I took when I was doing our aerial surveys. And if you go down to Brownsville, Minnesota, you pass some lovely breweries on your way down, but they have an observation deck where you can see quite a few of the, the tundra swans and it's a lot of fun to spend time there. This is a picture of what it looks like from the observation deck. And there are other waterfowl species mixed in there too, and there are bald eagles. So it's 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 a fun day trip to take in November. And then of course there are bald eagles and that is uh, the, their migration. It's kind of spotty. Bald eagles, uh, they don't, they, they only go so far. They only go as far as they have to. And so we have these pockets along the Mississippi River where you can find quite a few. Sometimes Colville Park and Red Wing can have anywhere from 50 to 100 bald eagles hanging out in the open water there all winter long. Uh, if you stop at any of the locks and dams along the Mississippi Sorry. River. What's your 62? What, what was that? Did someone ask a question? Oh, sorry. Hmm. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, so uh, if you stop at any of the locks and dams uh, uh, south of the mist, south of the Twin Cities, anywhere where there's open water uh, in December and well into January and February, you can see congregations of bald eagles. And, and that can be a lot of fun as well. Oh, and in November, we get golden eagles. Uh, golden eagles uh, only show up in kind of the southeastern part of the state. Some of them might show up in Houston County. Uh, in Wabasha and the areas on both sides of the Mississippi and Minnesota and Wisconsin can be a good place to see them. They do pass over Hawk Ridge, but you have a much better shot to get them in and around Wabasha. And they like goat prairies. They like uh, to be up on bluffs, bluffs that uh, tend to be drier and have more open areas. And that's where they perch. When they first started uh, being reported in the area, that was when I first moved to Minnesota in the early to mid nineties, uh, people were saying, yeah, I saw a golden eagle down near Wabasha. Him. And experienced birders said, no, 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 you saw amateur bald eagles. They look similar to golden eagles. Like, no, 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 that's what it was. And then someone got a picture. And Scott Me, who's from the National Eagle Center, started doing golden eagle surveys. And we now have 88 to 100 golden eagles that spend the winter uh, in that area. Uh, Mark Martell has done some satellite uh, transmitter studies and it's shown that these birds nest up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, uh, so they they nest up in British Columbia and then they come down here uh, to spend the winter. And their migration is timed pretty closely with deer season. Uh, once the deer opener happens and there are deer gut piles all over the place, the golden eagles are chowing down on that. And then their diet shifts to rabbits and turkeys. Uh, it, it's really fascinating. If you're in an area where golden eagles are possible and you see a flock of turkeys out in the middle of a field and you suddenly see them running like crazy people, uh, look up because that means that there's a golden. Bald eagles don't seem to bother the turkeys so much, but they know golden eagles mean business. Uh, I do some writing sometimes for Outdoor News, which is an outdoor publication that covers quite a bit of hunting. And every now and then I'll be sent some photos from a game cam. And I have had photos sent to me from Wisconsin and Illinois in the wintertime of immature golden eagles trying to capture deer, live deer. Uh, I don't think they're ever successful because uh, a healthy deer can definitely outrun a golden eagle. But I think what happens is these young golden eagles come down and they eat all these dead deer and then they kind of finish with the turkeys and around about January or February they're like kind of tired of turkey and rabbit and I'm a little hungry. I, you know, I, I kind of miss deer. I wonder if I could kill one. And uh, I don't know of any documented cases in Minnesota or Wisconsin of a golden eagle killing a deer. I know there are a lot of videos of falconry golden eagles uh, killing deer on YouTubes, but that doesn't count because they're getting a human assist, even if you don't see it in those videos. All right. All right. So November and December, like I said, Point Douglas is a great place to go to look for waterfowl in December. Uh, the water stays open there. As it freezes and the ice creeps in closer to shore, it makes it better because it pushes all the ducks and swans and eagles closer and makes it easier to see. Uh, but as things, uh, when, it's, when, it's, when it's more open, the birds are a little further out, but it's a great spot to look for mergansers. And these are some pictures that I've taken from around that area. Uh, this is uh, Point Douglas where there's a ton of uh, common mergansers. You can see a bald eagle sitting out there looking wistfully at the mergansers, wishing it could catch one. 
golden eyes are of course out there, uh, Canada geese, and we get some rare species of gulls that show up. This is a glaucus gull mixed in with Canada geese. And just to give you an idea of how big that bird is, look at it in <laughs> comparison to Canada geese, that gull is gigantic. Uh, Lake Pepin will get quite a few mergansers. There have been reports of a million mergansers on Lake Pepin in December. So it's kind of cool to go around a red wing and scan and look for those large flocks of common mergansers hanging out on Pepin. And I know I've talked about this going into December and, you know, that's kind of winter time-ish. And I know Brian gets really bummed about winter because he can't go bike riding as much as he would like. But I would just like to say spring kind of starts bird-wise in February because that's when we get our first migrants back. Horned larks return to the state in February. Yes, these crazy birds seem to think coming out to our farm fields in southern Minnesota is a good idea in February. So if you need a reminder of spring, you just watch for these little dudes flushing off the side of gravel roads in southern Minnesota. So some of the things that I've talked about, if you would like to follow migration some more uh, or learn a little bit more, there's a great app called the Bird's Eye app. Uh, that one is a paid app, but it works for Android or um, iPhone, but it will tell you what birds are being reported and where to find them and even give you driving directions. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology offers a great website called BirdCast, and it will give you pr predictions uh, based on weather and time of year as to where to expect bird movement and to see the most birds, and it is, it is insanely accurate. You can follow them on Facebook or you can go to birdcast.info. Um, if you need help identifying birds, I highly recommend the free Merlin app. Uh, I think if you saw my program last time I talked about this and there's been an update to it, Merlin will now identify bird sounds and it is, it's not 100%, but it is one of the best bird sound uh, ID apps that I've come across and you can walk around outside with it and it will uh, tell you what birds are singing around you. iNaturalist is another app that will let you know not only birds, but plants and animals that are reported around you. Uh, if you'd like to get more involved with the Minnesota birding community and you're on Facebook, uh, there's the Minnesota birding Facebook page. I'm one of the admins. So if, if you think I have good bird information, uh, we can help you out with that. It's also run by Alex Sunval, who is uh, uh, quite the talented young birder. And again, if you're interested in looking at bird migration, uh, just Google University of Madison Bird Radar. And actually, while I'm wrapping this up, I'm going to check bird migration right now because it's dark outside and see if there's any movement going on. Just give me a sec. Brian, look pretty while I do this. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay, I'm gonna hold this up. This is this is that app right now, and I just opened it up. See those blue circles popping up? That is a time lapse of the last hour, and those are birds that are popping up and flying. So all those blue circles, they're detecting bird movement. So I don't see it quite yet in Minnesota, but maybe in another hour we might see a blue circle over the Twin Cities. And if there is, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna listen to some birds. So I'm gonna. Stop sharing. And then if people have questions. This is Rob. Hey, um, hey Rob. I'm wondering uh, any migration on Osprey? Oh, that's a good question. Osprey have mostly uh, gotten out of the state. They get out uh, a little earlier than some of the raptors. In theory, as long as we have open water, we should be able to see them. But uh, I haven't seen one for the last few days. So I'm thinking they're mostly out of the state by this point. Thanks. Sure. Osprey are one of the true specialists. They only eat fish. They've only ever been documented eating fish, not a mammal. Uh, is Point, Point Douglas down by Red Wing? Is that, that where they have the, uh, the very large birds down there? <laughs> Uh, that's Colville Park in Red Wing uh, that you're thinking of. Point Douglas is closer to Hastings and Prescott. Uh, it's, okay. it's actually on the Minnesota side of the Mississippi River right across from Prescott. And fun fact, there is that lift railroad bridge that's right there. Peregrine falcons nest on that. So you might, you know, if, if, if you're down at Point Douglas, sometimes it behooves you to go across uh, the bridge, maybe stop for something to eat at Muddy Waters or stand in back of Muddy Waters and see if you can get an osprey too. Or not osprey, peregrine falcon, sorry. <laughs> I have a question about your eagle picture that you had, the photo. Um, uh -huh. The last couple of Januarys, I've gone down and helped with that or golden eagle count. And I'm very much a novice beginner in identifying them. 
But that picture you had up there to me looks like more gold or more bald eagle because of the white under the wings. Oh, can you come on? Can you comment on that? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's an excellent question. Let me uh, let me share my screen again. Although the head was small, so then it looked like a golden eagle. Well, yeah, and you know those are really excellent field marks to talk about. So here's that golden eagle, and there's the white that you're talking about on there. On golden eagles, especially young golden eagles that have this pattern of white, it's a very distinct pattern. It's three spots. There's one on each wing and one on the tail. So one, two, three. When okay. it's an immature bald eagle, it looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. It looks like somebody splattered it with paint. It's very splash. It's very splattered and mm -hmm. it's not uniform at all. The yeah. other way that you can tell these birds apart, I know like when we're talking about raptor identification, we typically talk about turkey vultures having that V shape or the dihedral. Mm -hmm. Golden eagles tend to show a dihedral too. Not quite as pronounced as a turkey vulture, but a turkey vulture is always gonna do that kind of rocking back and forth. Whereas golden eagles don't do that rocking, but they definitely have a dihedral. So good identification. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That that was a great question. Thank you. Well, I'm looking at the head too. The head looks smaller, but sometimes you can't tell from the angle. It, it is. And, and that was a photo that I took when I was doing a bird survey. Uh, and I took uh, with my iPhone onto my spotting scope. I'm, I still can't believe I got that picture. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. And Sharon, one more question. Um, woodpeckers, do they migrate or? Yes and no. Some species of woodpeckers migrate. Um, the northern flicker, um, that's the, the brownish one with the black spots. When they fly, you can see yellow on the wings. That's migratory. And um, we might have a few that spend the winter here, but for the most part, they get out of the state. Another one that uh, moves quite a bit is the red-headed woodpecker. But again, we can still have a handful in the state. They don't do kind of like the complete migration like some other species do, but those two species in particular definitely have a movement. Cool. So for an amateur uh, to this area, what is the V-ing for the, uh, the when the, the, as the ducks get, you know, head south, what's the purpose of the V kind of in the sky? <laughs> Well, no one's ever really interviewed a duck to find out. So we don't know for sure. But the guess is, is that it creates kind of an aerodynamic flow that that kind of uh, helps them expend less energy and they kind of switch around in the V shape. And ducks aren't the only ones that do it. Um, uh, egrets will do it. Uh, the egrets tend to migrate at night, so we don't see it as much. But when I've seen those birds moving through at, at dawn in the morning, they're definitely in a V-shape. Uh, cormorants will also do it. But I think it's those birds that have kind of the longer necks. Uh, they just tend, it, it, it makes a more aerodynamic flow. Kind of like them. the bicycle drafting kind of? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to think of it, yeah. yeah okay. How about the so, center by the by the mega mall there? There's is there a good that's a good is that a good site for seeing any uh, migration or? Oh yeah, Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge is a fantastic spot to go any time of year. Uh, um, yeah, and you can go either they have the the trailhead over by the bass ponds. That's one of my favorite places to go, uh, especially during migration. You go down that hill and all those little ponds back there can be loaded with birds. And in August, if you kind of go, if you can get to the river, it can be really great for shorebirds out there as well and for ducks. In the last couple of weeks, uh, people have had gotten really good looks over at the old Cedar Avenue Bridge, the kind of retooled bridge that we can bike over over now. Yeah. Um, if you look down in there, you can usually get ducks and egrets, but there's this type of small water bird called a Sora, which you tend to hear more than you see. It kind of looks like a little blue water chicken uh, with gigantic toes. And uh, that's, yeah, that bridge is, a, is an excellent spot. It's also a good area to look for saw white owls too. Got a little, I mean, it's actually more a bicycling trip, but down by Trempolo, Wisconsin, there's a wildlife refuge that's really cool. And Pro State Park, and that's you have to kind of go down this bicycle down this little dirt road to get in there, but it's really cool. There's a lot of nice birding down there. So, yes, I have uh, refashioned a Topeak trunk bag to be able to carry my spotting scope so I can go birding, and I also have a, a little REI bag that that's where my binoculars sit. I love I love going bike birding. 
Yeah, I did a lot of bike birding in Alaska and I, I felt very badass doing that. And I got and I got some live birds in there. I even got my nemesis spruce grouse finally. So last year, just looking out my patio doors over the pond that I lived nearby, I think I had 26 species of birds that I saw. That's this great. Year, I've had four or five different species, and that's it. Any have you had any changes in your backyard? Any trees taken out? Any construction going on? Well, yeah, actually, there was one tree taken out, but I can't remember exactly when that was. But yeah, there had been construction going on. They were reciting my whole complex and re-roofing the whole thing. So that could have been so some disruption that workers were in the area. Yeah, sometimes uh, disturbances like that can keep birds away. Or if you had a tree that birds like to use as cover, um, before birds come into water or to a bird feeding station, they, they like to hang out like uh, the birds in our yard, they really like hanging out in the dogwood or uh, the choke cherry before they make it in. If we take any of those out, we're gonna, we're gonna lose some of those birds. Yeah. Um, another thing is the drought has had a significant effect on birds this year. I'm, I'm kind of dreading what some of the bird numbers are gonna be over the winter. Um, I don't know if you heard the Eastern bluebird population suffered a devastating blow this winter because of the Texas deep freeze. Yeah. And the birds that were able to make it up in Minnesota, they're not having great nest success because the drought affected the insects. Um, and I don't think we know the full ramifications of how bad this breeding season was for insect eating birds. Uh, a friend of mine uh, does boreal chickadee research up in northern Minnesota. And when the season started, she had 11 nests she was monitoring. And by the end of the season, almost all the nests had failed and the adults had abandoned it or the chicks had died and presumably malnutrition. Abandoning a nest is something a, an adult does when they just can't bring enough food. So that could also be a factor in this as well. And if anybody's missing goldfinches, I am at fault. I have hundreds in the yard right now, but I spoil them rotten by feeding them the expensive extra fine sunflower chips. <laughs> Why not? The backyard. Oh, the backyard. All the goldfinches are. Yeah, they really, they really are <laughs> in yeah. our backyard. So we have a question in the chat. Which species takes the longest flight hours to migrate? Well, now that is a great question because there is just this, I visited in the last seven days, a species that has blown all records. It is a bar-tailed godwit that went from uh, Alaska all the way down to New Zealand, and it flew a total of 239 hours nonstop. That's insane. But they had satellite data on it and they were able to track it. I know, OMFG. And uh, not only that, somebody who was like part, had been following the project and knew exactly where the bird landed, went out and took a picture of the bird and you could see the transmitter and it's banned. So, I mean, it's not even like we were just saying the transmitter, I don't know, accidentally got hooked on a boat and made it down there. No, it, it did it on its own two wings. And that 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 was giving me life last week, uh, reading that amazing record. Yeah. Goldfinches eat your Swiss shard. Yeah, goldfinches, you know, and they love coneflower. Uh, that's another thing. And black-eyed Susan seeds, yeah. Goldfinches, they, they love. If you can plant some native plants in your backyard, you will have lots of happy birds. This is Judy, and I have sort of a personal bird refuge because I have an uncapped chimney where I get chimney swifts every year. And um, yeah, I can't bring myself to cap it, but I light very few fires in the winter because I know there's stuff up there. <laughs> um, I, I'm almost never there in the winter though. I'm back in Florida and now I'm a snowbird, huh. but the gold flinches are lovely. I mean, the chimney swifts are lovely. I understand they go clear to South America um and uh, they're they're very very fast um i did notice they were gone by mid-august this year i don't know if it was too few insects or if that's their normal schedule because i haven't you know i haven't kept a diary of when they leave and when they come back they typically are one of the earlier birds to leave like you'll start to see them flock up around the state fair that's usually when i <laughs> I see the start of uh, nighthawk migration. I, I time a lot of migration by the state fair, but they typically stay afterwards, but birds that didn't have good success uh, sometimes will leave early. Makes sense. I noticed very few robins around also this year during the drought. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. And Robins, they love water. They love to bathe. Um, and if, if you're someone like Judy and you think chimney swifts are cool, uh, but you have a cap chimney, there are plans in books and on the internet to make fake chimneys for chimney swifts. And you can either put these little fake chimneys on your roof, or you can put them in your backyard, but you, it is possible to make a chimney swift habitat if you need to. Has anyone seen or heard the whippoorwill? I used to hear them all the time when I was a kid, and they seem to have vanished entirely. Anyone camped and heard them, or about, are they? Where did, you, where did you hear them as a kid? What part of the state? Uh, right by the St. Clair River, across from the Sunrise Landing, um, just north of Wild River State Park. Uh, St. Croix Falls. Okay. They do nest at Grey Cloud Dunes Scientific and Natural Area in Cottage Grove. But yeah, whippoorwills are a species of special decline and uh, are a species of special concern because they are definitely in the decline, as are common nighthawks. So yeah, if anybody has seen whippoorwills, let us know. Just a comment, because Sharon, you are so good. Your flow, <laughs> your speed, your knowledge, everything. I'm just oh, always yeah. impressed to hear you on the radio and see you is even better. So well, everyone who so agrees, sad. raise their hand with a little, what you call it. <laughs> yeah. So engaging. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>